Jeremiah chapter 35. I don't know if this has happened to you. It's happened to me. And probably has happened to you when you were probably younger. Possibly at work. Definitely in your family. But you have you ever been compared to someone else? Where your parents might have compared you to a sibling? Someone that was maybe um, a little greater than you, a little better than you, maybe nicer, maybe a little more handsome. <laughs> you know, they make the, that mistake and, and say, why can't you be like your brother? Or why can't you be like so-and-so down the street? He's a nice little boy. What happened to you? <laughs> you know, those, th- those things can be devastating, right? I... I kind of thought about that as I was reading this because God is going to do that with Israel. He's going to compare them with the Canaanites, which are not his children. And he's going to say, why can't you be like them? And I thought, wow, Lord, here all these years I thought that was bad. But when you really think about a parent who does that, I don't know if I did it or not. Virginia would know more than, than I would about that because she remembers so much more. She keeps track of me. <laughs> But I, I, I think of a parent who would say that to their child. It's not to devastate them or to hurt them. I don't believe that. Because a parent loves their children. I really believe that. Uh, a, bar- a parent loves all their children. Not just one, but all of them. A parent may praise one child, but doesn't mean that he or she doesn't praise the other children. He's just praising that child at that moment. Because there's a love for all of them. A special love in, in, in our hearts for our children. And our desire really is for our children to be obedient, right? To, to obey so that they don't get into trouble later on down the road. Learn how to obey now so that when you're older, you can obey the laws, you can, you can obey society, you can obey you know, God and, and live a prosperous life and hopefully a peaceful life and not a you know, um, disastrous life. That's really the heart of a parent. So when a parent says, why can't you be like that boy? What, he's, what the parent is saying, why can't you behave yourself? It's really what they're saying. Behave yourself. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Be obedient because I'm trying to save you from something. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to pull something away from you. You know, I'm trying to love you by correcting you in this situation. So it's not a belittlement. It's, it's definitely an encouragement for that child to be better. I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Now we always go to this one scripture, uh, do, not be, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits, right? And that's a beautiful scripture. In other words, if you're hanging around the wrong people, they're going to corrupt you. That's just a principle that God has given to us. Hang around the wrong crowd, and you end up being like that crowd. We kind of mentioned it on Sunday. Who are you following? And you become like them if you're following them. But it's interesting how Paul ends up with that verse in in Corinthians, starting in verse 29. He says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? Apparently, somebody had brought in this doctrine where, and I think it's a part of the Mormon doctrine today, <clears throat> where when a person dies, you can actually get baptized for that person. Uh, wash away their sins and so forth, and they're able to you know, go into the presence of God or the, in the temple of the Lord and, and so forth. But it's interesting that Paul refutes that. He says, if the dead do not rise at all, in other words, there, there's this thought that the dead don't rise. There is no resurrection of the dead. Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Now, he's talking about our body to himself and to his flesh. He's dying daily to the things of this world. If I, in the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. 
For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He's correcting them. You're listening to these people who are baptizing the dead. If there is no resurrection, there's no need to do that. I don't agree with that. And you're hanging around them. Don't do that. Don't hang around people that, that are teaching false doctrine, that aren't teaching scripture, that are leading you astray. Be careful because that kind of evil company will corrupt good habits. Good habits. And so we want to really find people that are godly people to hang around with, right? We want good examples. You always hear this. Find someone that's uh, a little older than you in the Lord and let them mentor you in a sense or at least disciple you. I had a really good friend of mine in um, Calvary Chapel, Mariloma, when they were out here. <clears throat> His name was Gary Bailey and a really, really gifted uh, individual, really sensitive. He had been single all the way till about 34 or so, 35, just really loved the Lord and served the Lord pretty much, and he still is to this day. I think he's at Harvest over there uh, serving. But he, he discipled me. <clears throat> I remember meeting uh, once a week with him, and we'd sit down in the kitchen there and, and just uh, go through Jude. I remember Jude and, and just going through the scriptures, but at the same time giving me practical uh, lessons, <clears throat> you know, on relationships. Uh, he would say things like, when, when you're talking with someone, he says, I notice this about you. When you talk to someone, you always look down. He goes, why do you do that? Don't look down. Look them straight in the eyes. Because when you look at them straight in the eyes, they know that you're listening and they know you care. And just little things like that that, that just um, helped me in my walk. I, I wish we could have spent a lot more time together. It, it was short-lived because I would have learned uh, a lot more, I'm sure, from him and, and probably would have saved me from a lot of mistakes when I began the ministry in, in dealing with people. So we want to find a good example. So the theme this evening is follow a good example. Follow a good example. Now that would probably take some time to find a good example, but... You think of some of the men that are teachers in our community here or some of the people in the church and maybe even a friend that you may know of. And when I say follow them, I don't mean that you follow them around, but you learn from them. I love hanging around people because people have different qualities. You notice that about people. They have certain strengths in one area and, and others have strengths in other areas. And, and I like seeing those strengths in people and I, I learn from that. Uh, the flaws, I know God's working in them. He's not done with them yet. You know, and I can throw that aside. And that's okay. But where's their strengths and how can I learn those strengths that they have? A lot of times, it's just the fact that they're just strong in that area. If it's sin, they just aren't prone to it. You know, they're not prone to that type of sin for some reason. Others are prone to it, but they aren't. And I want to know why. You know, is it your DNA or, or, or what? So follow a good example. Now, now here, what we have in this chapter, again, it's not chronological. Babylon has not taken over Judah yet. It's before last week's chapter that this took place, about 587 uh, B.C., before Christ. Uh, Jeremiah will be visiting uh, the Rechabites, and he will, in a sense, um, fellowship with them and, and, and find out um, their characteristic. And then God will use that to correct Judah. So let's look at the obedience of the Rechabites. What a beautiful name, a Rechabite. The tribe of the Rechabites. And the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehokim, the son of Joash, king of Judah, saying, Go to the house of the Rechabites. Speak to them and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Now they were a nomadic tribe and we'll see that in a second here uh, they didn't have homes they, they kind of like um, 
maybe some tribes today in the Middle East where they really don't have homes. In fact, some, some places in uh, nomads in, in Israel, they don't like homes. They've built homes for them, but they don't want to live in those homes. They pretty much stay empty and they like being in tents and they just kind of move their tents around and they have sheep and they move around with the sheep kind of uh, attitude. And that's what these people are. They are descendants of, Can- of the Canaanites, First uh, Chronicles chapter 2. Second Kings chapter ten fifteen possibly descends from Jehonab, Jehoadab, son of Rechab. In verse three it says, "Then I took Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Hasbazaniah, his brother, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites." probably the whole clan there, the group of men that he lists there. Don't know much about them, but they are Rechabites. Uh, he's more interested in their character than who they are as individuals here. So, I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igadil, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes. Above the chamber of Manasseh, the son of Shulam, the keeper of the door. Now this was a priestly family, and they were royal officials who had rooms there in the temple. Uh, And they were laborers there in the temple, whether they were to sacrifice the offerings, the meals, or or what. And so um, they brought them into the temple, into these rooms. Uh, One of them was a keeper of the door which was responsible for overseeing the, the collection of the temple taxes. Uh, and so they're bringing him into these people to, to sit them down and to talk about them. And he says, Then I set, the, set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites bowls full of wine and cups. And I said to them, Drink wine. So as he sets these before them, he's, he's hoping to see them drink wine as a test of their character. What will their response be as uh, he offers them this? But they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commands us, saying, you shall not drink, or you shall drink no wine, you nor your sons forever. I thought that was... I know there's more to it, I'm sure. I mean, you can almost picture uh, the father speaking to them. Okay, we're not drinking wine. And this is why. Because when you drink wine, you know, you look foolish. When you drink wine, it causes problems. When you drink wine, you know, I'm sure there was a lot more to it here. But as the text, it just says, look, our father said don't drink wine, so we don't drink wine. I I like that. (laughs) I mean, that's obedience, right? I mean, that's just a, a simple obedience to what they're, Father's request was to them. And that should be children and their parents. As parents, as they lead their children, as they guide their children and direct their children, that their children be obedient. God wants obedience rather than sacrifices and offerings, he tells uh, Samuel. I'm sorry, Saul. Right? He, he wants obedience. Uh, God would rather us obey him and struggle with supporting him struggle with serving him he would rather have the obedience more than the sacrifices and the offerings because the sacrifices and offerings can be covers for disobedience it it makes us feel better that we're actually doing something but we're really being disobedient to the lord and we try to justify it by what we're doing by our actions and so forth and that's where we can really get into trouble because then our hearts become hardened and we're not really having a a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're having a religious experience with Christ where it's our works. And God doesn't want a religious experience. This isn't about religion. It's not about Calvary Chapel. It's not about church in the definition of the world. This is about a one-on-one personal relationship with Jesus Christ between you and him because God sent his son to die on the cross for you. Now, that's nice when you hear that and you probably associate that with someone else and not you. But God wants you to associate that death on the cross for you because he did it for you, because he loves you, because he knows that in this world there is sin that was brought by Adam and became our nature. And we have a tendency to sin against God. 
And so we're separated from God because of that sin, because that's what sin does. It, it brings forth death. It brings separation. Uh, you, that simple f- logic is there in families. You have a child that is constantly rebellious, that constantly is fighting and arguing and destroying things in the household. What, what happens? You, you separate them. They, they, you can't live here anymore. You know, you're not abiding by the rules here. And so it's time for you to go. And you separate them because that's what sin does. So sin has separated us from the Father because our nature is sinful. And so he sends his son to take our place on the cross so that now we can have a relationship with God. Though our nature is still sinful and we still struggle, yet God gives us a new spirit. A spirit that desires to be obedient that desires not to be disruptive in the family, that desires to have peace and rest, that desires to be more like Christ who died on the cross for them. And so he then unites families. He then unites us with him. And he creates that relationship. And so we have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so now as we walk with him, it's not based upon what we're doing. It's not based upon how much we're giving. It's all based upon our relationship with him and obedience to him. First John tells us that if we say we love him and we don't keep his commandments, then we really don't love him. And he also says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so that's a measuring stick. How do I know if I love God? Are you keeping his commandments? Now, again, you're not keeping his commandments for salvation so that you can enter into heaven. You're keeping his commandments because you love him. Just like that son, if he were to come back, say, okay, I'll abide by your rules because I I really want our relationship. I miss you, mom and dad. I don't want to be separated from you, at least anymore. And so now he's willing to abide by the rules and the regulations that you have set up in your household. That's what God wants. These guys heard their father say, look, we don't drink wine. Okay, dad, we don't drink wine. And and I find it interesting because um, it's been going on like this for years for them. Look at verse 7. You shall not build a house, sow seed, plant a vineyard, nor have any of these, but all your days you shall dwell in tents, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. So this rule that he made required them to abstain from alcohol agriculture and permanent housing sounds like they're sojourners right it sounds like they're not to dwell in one place too long for me it reminds me of my residence here on earth that this isn't our home we're sojourners like jacob we're only here for a time and for a season and some of us are a little closer to the end of that season than others but there's always an end. A time to be born, Luke, and a time to die, someone else. That's life. And so the question is, what happens after you die? That's a big question. That's a question that we should all be asking. What happens after I die? For the Christian, we go into the presence of the Lord in heaven. For the person that is not a Christian, that's the question mark. Where do I go? Well, the Bible says you go to hell. You're separated from God for eternity because of your sins and your rebelliousness against him. That's where you go, the Bible says. Well, I don't believe that, and that's fine. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it at all. You can give me all the evidence that you have, which is none but what you believe. That's it. There's no hard evidence on it. There's no book. There's no, you know, just what other men might tell you, that they agree with you, but that's the evidence that you have. Here's the question, though. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong and then the Bible is right? Then guess what? You lose. You lose. Now, what if, what if I'm wrong? I mean, well, what if the Bible isn't right? Well, then we all lose. We just go into nothing. So why are you taking the chance? Believe the Bible just in case, right? Just in case you're wrong. At least you get eternal life if you're wrong. But if I'm wrong, we all get the same thing, right? And so give the Lord an opportunity and a chance. He's not wrong. We're sojourners here. This isn't our home. 
This isn't where we dwell. This isn't where we live for eternity. We're only here for a season, 80, 90 years. Some have already gone there and in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah for the promises of God. And so they weren't to have any tie to this world in a sense. We don't know the reason for this. It doesn't tell us why. And again, the point that God is using here is their obedience to their father. That's basically it. Thus we have obeyed the voice of Jonadad, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he charged us, to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, or our daughters. So for 200 years they have kept this rule. 200 years. That's all we know. They kept the rule. That is obedience. Nor to build ourselves houses dwell in, nor do we have vineyards, fields, or seeds. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jenadab, our father, commands us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, Come, let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. So they were obedient to their father. And the only reason that they're there in Jerusalem and Jeremiah sees them and God uses that opportunity to use them as an example of obedience because they're fearful of Babylon, this great nation that was going to come upon them. So this is a story really of obedience, commitment, and character. Now, it's not a story about children obeying their parents. It's a story about God's children obeying God being committed to God and to his principles that we find in the Bible and also our character as children of God. Are we obedient when God directs us through the scriptures? We need to have a willing heart and a desire to be obedient. If you are born again, God gives you a desire to obedience. That when he directs us, our hearts would say, Lord, help me to do that because I know that's the right thing to do. That's just the right thing to do, Lord. I want to be obedient to you. And my flesh struggles. My flesh doesn't want to do it, but I know it's the right thing to do. Whether it's in our relationships with one another, husband and wives, whether it's our children, our families, whether it's for the civil in, in the state that we live in, whether it's in the church and authority and so forth, it's the right thing to do, what the Lord has written. Not what man has said, but what the Lord has written and being obedient to that. And being committed. Being committed to it. Co commitment basically means you're committed to go through it all the way. It doesn't mean you'll be successful all the time. It doesn't mean you'll, you, you'll be able to be obedient 100% of the time. Possibly 75% of the time. <laughs> Maybe 80. Hopefully you get up to 95%. But it means you're committed to keep going at it. You've got your hands on the plow. You're not going to look back. You're going to keep going no matter how many rocks you hit. No, no matter how hard it gets. You're committed to do it. And that's Christianity. It's perseverance, right? It's what the epistles talk about. Let's, let's persevere. Not give up. Because we have a prize. Paul talks about a race. And men running the race. And you run the race to win. And that's why you're in the race. And so we're to persevere. We're to be committed. And, and doing that builds that character builds the character in us and we should be men and women of character paul was a man of character you can depend on paul when he gave you his word he kept his word when he said he would do something he did something about it uh, he reflected that character of god god loved paul loved god forgave paul forgave god corrected paul corrects God lives in, or Paul lives an example, he is an example in life because he has character and that character comes from God. We're to be great examples. So let, let's see why God uh, brings these people up. Verse 12, then came the word of the Lord to Jeremiah saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And that's, God's way of saying all of Israel, <laughs> Judah and 
Jerusalem. Everybody, I want you to go and tell them. Will you not receive instructions to obey my words, says the Lord? Uh, that, that's pretty simple. You, you don't have to be a theologian to understand that. You know, God is very clear. Look, these guys had a father, and his father said, don't drink, don't plant seeds, don't have houses. And they said, okay, Daddy. And I tell you, don't have idols, don't worship those false images, don't give yourselves away uh, in unequally yoked situations. And can't you obey me? It's that simple. Why haven't you done that? So God pleads, pleads for Israel to obey. Then came the word of the Lord to Jeremiah there. And the word of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. For to this day they drink none and obey their father's commandments. But although I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, you did not obey me. I have also sent to you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Turn now, everyone, from his evil way. Are, uh, amend your doings and do not go after other gods to serve them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers. But you have not inclined your ear nor obeyed me. Reminds me of the parable that Jesus gave of the vineyard and how he would send servants to the managers of the vineyard he was the owner and they would beat up the servants and finally at the end he sends his son and they kill his son and you see the rebelliousness of the religious rulers during the time of Jesus as he's giving this parable speaking of them you know, here I have sent you prophets from the Old Testament. I have given you prophecies concerning the Messiah. I have showed you all these signs and all these wonders. You say of your father Abraham, but you're not of your father Abraham. You're of the devil because you have come to kill me. And Jesus is standing now, the Son of God, before them. And in their minds is nothing but murder. Murder in their minds for him. And exactly what he said in the parable of the vineyard is what was in their mind to kill the son because they did not want the vineyard to be taken away from them. And I think about Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem. Matthew twenty three thirty seven, As Jesus was overlooking Jerusalem, possibly there the Mount of Olives because I believe it's probably only the one of the only places that you could see Jerusalem on a high mountain or overseeing it and I can almost imagine him just kind of maybe squatting there and he's looking out towards Jerusalem and he says oh Jerusalem Jerusalem and, and saying it twice means he, he he's really moved by what is going on there Jerusalem Jerusalem and his heart gets heavy. The one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. When you <laughs> read Hebrews chapter 11, the, we call it the Hall of Faith. <laughs> Not the Hall of Fame like they have here in the world, but this is the Hall of Faith because it lists all of the prophets in the Old Testament that have been successful in their faith in God and have gone through horrific things, uh, men that have been sawed in half uh, by the religious leaders, uh, men who have been thrown into lion's dens and so forth. And, and it's a testimony to their faith in God that they trusted in God even unto death, unto death. That should say something to us, that we should have faith and trust in God, even in life. The Bible says that God has us in his palm, in his palm. And there is nothing bigger than his palm because it's God's palm. He's got the universe within the span of his hand, the Bible says. Chuck was talking about black holes today. I don't know if you heard him. 
It was talking about how black holes created, at least scientifically, what they how they believe it's created, and it's created by by being crunched together, uh, mass matter crunched together, and the pressure that that's there because of the gravity. And just really short, because I'm not a scientist, basically he said, if you take this whole universe that we're in and just start to crush it into as small as of an item as you can, the pressure is so great that it, it starts to suck everything in. It becomes a black hole. If you were to go through that black hole, you would come out to another universe. And if that universe were to get sucked in to a black hole, you'd go out that black hole and you'd be another universe. And no matter where you're at, God is there. That's pretty big when you think about it. Huge. And so God having you on the palm of his hand, you're safe. You are so, you can never be safer than that at all, no matter where you're at. Now, when we think about, well, what do you mean by safe? I can still fall off a building if I jump, or, you know, or, or a car can come by and hit me. You know, what do you mean by safe? Well, yeah, those things can happen. We live in a fallen world, and in a fallen world, things happen like that. Uh, the, the repercussions of our sin, our parents, Adam and Eve, and so forth. But you're still safe, because you're in the palm of the Lord's hands. He's going to use that for His glory. And if you die, you go into His presence. And it's done, and it's over for the next billion, trillion quadrillion and then add another trillion quadrillion times that and then you're still not there add and multiply another quadrillion billion trillion quadzillion gazillion zillion and that's just the beginning of eternity compared to 80 years here on this earth god has you in the palm of his hands he's written your name the bible says that he has collected every tear that you've dropped out of your eyes. That's how much he loves you. That's a loving and caring God. And so when he's looking down at Jerusalem, he's like, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the ones who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. His heart was to to gather them you know I love you I, I want to gather you to myself a, a wayward son I, I want to gather you I miss you I have, a, I have a son that we don't see quite often I miss him I wish he would come over more reminds me of a story I, I heard where there was a fire in a, a hen house <clears throat> just burnt everything to the ground. And as they were looking through the rubble of this hen house, they found a burnt carcass of a hen. And it was just burnt to a crisp. And as they went over, they, they, they kind of touched it and it crumbled. But underneath the hen were chicks. And all the chicks came running out. And that's what Jesus wants to do. It, like, come to me. I want to just take care of you and protect you from what's around you. And so he tells them, look, I want to gather you as a hen gathers his chicks under their wings. But the problem is you're not willing. You don't want me. You're not willing to surrender your life to me. You're not willing to even give me an opportunity to show myself. You're just totally against it. And I can't do anything because I will not infringe on your free will. I will not force you. I love you enough to say I've created you as an individual that can think for yourself, that can make decisions, and I'm leaving it up to you to decide for me or to decide against me. You wouldn't, and so I couldn't, is what he was saying. But you were not willing. See? Your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's speaking of the second coming of Christ.
<clears throat> Israel will see them again after the tribulation period. Surely the son of man, verse 16, Jenadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandments of their fathers, which he commanded them, but this people <laughs> has not obeyed me. Almost sounds like the, the conversation between Moses and God. You remember that? Moses, go down there. Your people. Wait a minute, God, they're not my people. They're your people. <laughs> you know, I didn't make them. You, you made them. And so God here says, the people, this people. God, you know when... You know you're, that someone's mad when they say something like that, right? Virginia and I once in a while was like, your sons. <laughs> what do you mean my sons? <laughs> you were a part of it too. Well, right now they're your sons. <laughs> she goes, no, they're your sons. They act just like you. <laughs> you know? So you know, <laughs> you know that there's a problem when, when we use that phrase. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring on Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the doom that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them, but they have not heard. And I have called to them, but they have not answered. <clears throat> you know, God has called. And he continues to call. This is definitely an example of, of God's persistence and love for Israel too, by the way. I mean, just look at Israel and, and you cannot come back with God hates Israel. God's never liked Israel. No, you come back with God definitely is pursuing Israel no matter what the consequences are. I mean, here's a, a chosen people that God chose through Abraham and through Abraham's seeds becomes the 12 tribes and then becomes the nation Israel. And God has put his hand upon them. To this day, he still has his hand upon Israel. He is protecting them. He has a purpose for them. And that purpose is just to show the world who God is. Really, that's the whole purpose. That God has chosen an insignificant people, a people that is hated. They are a hated people. A lot, a lot of people hate them. Even in the Christian church, they boycott anything that's Jewish and kosher because they don't want Israel to prosper at all. They don't care about Israel. They're more concerned for Palestine and those persecuted people, those poor people that just want to express themselves and they don't know how to do it so they're doing it in a negative way and we just need to love them more. But poor Israel, they're at fault because they're so wise and so intelligent that they should know better than to mistreat them and not let them have what they want. What? What? To push us in the ocean and not exist anymore because that's what they want. Oh no, come on. You're just exaggerating. You're just exaggerating. I saw a, a little clip where Obama was addressing a, a group of people. I can't remember where it was, but he hired this guy to, to be his, his anger self. And so every time Obama would say something, this guy would get angry. You know, and just kind of express the anger. And so when Obama says, uh, said something like, uh, we, we need to make relationships uh, with Palestine and Israel, you know, just work on that. And the anger guy comes up and says, this ISIS stuff and those people that think they're so bad, you don't know what you're talking about. You know? And he's just like making a mockery of it all. And that's how the world looks at Israel. It looks at ISIS, look at, looks at Palestine who are killing people. Um, I just read another news article that they're in New Me they're in Mexico. I'm like they're a little behind. They're in the United States. <laughs> they're here. You you know they're here because they're saying they're in Mexico. When they were in Mexico, they were saying they're in other places. You know, <laughs> they're they're behind a little bit. No, they're here already, and their plans are going to be known here real soon. But you look at Israel and you, you just have to say, boy, God loves them. And if God loves them and he tells us he loves the world and he loves me, he's not lying. He really does. And he wants to work on our behalf. He wants to bless us. He wants to do a work in our lives. That's how much he loves us. But we're not willing. Or, or, or we're just walking away and doing our own thing. Give God a chance. Give him an opportunity. Read his word. Pray. You know, just if you start with prayer, I guarantee you, um, if you were just to get up every day in the morning and just start throwing, just throwing your heart out to him, just I don't care what it is. He just loves that you throw your heart to him. Just get up in the morning and say, God, I'm here. Speak to me. Something. Lord, just 
I don't know what to even to tell you right now. I, 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 what, what do you want me to say? Tell me what, what to say, Lord. Here I am. I just, I just want to know you. And you'll spend the next hour just saying, I want to know you. I just want to know you. I want to, I want to feel your presence. I want you to use me. And just those little things, God's like, yeah, I've got them now right where I want them. And you watch what he does. He starts giving you desires. He starts giving you gifts. He starts using you. And you're going, all I said was, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know how to do it. Just help me do something. Could you use me? I, I don't know what. And he does because he wants your heart. And he begins to work in your life. But I guarantee you, if you just do that, I guarantee you, you'll start reading. You'll start serving the Lord. Your life will change completely. Because he wants a contrite spirit in his presence. And Jeremiah said to the house of Rechabite, a Rechabite, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me forever. Wow. So obedience to the Lord, surrendering to God, means that we have eternal security, basically. That's what he's saying. Look, because of your obedience, you'll always have a man before me. I'll guarantee you that. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 or so, he talks about the vine and the branches. And the Lord is the vine. We are the branches. Israel is the branch and we're grafted onto that branch. But he's the vine. He's the source of life itself. And he says, as long as you abide in the vine and bear fruit, you're fine. He will abide in you. And so that's what he's saying here. As long as you have obeyed your father to not drink, to not have house, to be a nomad in a sense, and you have been obedient to daddy, you'll be in the, my presence at all the time. And Jesus tells us, if you abide in me, if you walk with me, in that relationship, you're not going to be perfect. You'll fail. But if you commit yourself to me and you persevere, I will give you the character and I will give you the strength to be obedient to me. And you will continue to abide in my presence. And I'll abide in you. This is an idiom, this stand before, as God is basically saying that you will stand and worship me in the temple. A legacy, in a sense, of a people that love and worship the Lord God. Let me close. <clears throat> it's sad that Israel did not obey God. Even after this example they went on to be destroyed jerusalem and all and see we have a choice either we obey god or we'll continue on and suffer the choices that we've made by not obeying god and our life will be a struggle at all times or we can obey god and learn from this chapter and say, Lord, help me to be obedient to you. Help me to hear your voice as I read your word and as you guide me and give me commandments and principles to live by. Help me, Lord, to apply those things to my life. And I know that you'll bless me when you do that. Who are you following? Pick up a good example and follow them especially one that you know they're headed in the right direction. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, Paul said to the Thessalonians. You know you could follow us because we're following Christ. Thessalonians 3, 9, But not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Paul understood that we are examples. And some of you are examples. And people do look up at you, to you. Your children definitely look up to you. They definitely see your examples. And if you're in a negative, they're going to follow that negative. <clears throat> I remember 
out here on Etiwanda, Rudy and his son were by the liquor store. And the church used to be next to the liquor store. <clears throat> and he's telling me the story afterwards as he came into the church and he knelt down and said, I want Jesus Christ in my life right now. And he confessed him right there. He said, the, the reason I'm in here is because I was standing out there by the liquor store and I'm holding my son's hand and I'm ready to go buy a case of beer. And all of a sudden before my eyes flashed, my father holding my hand his father holding his hand and his father holding his hand and I just said that's it I got to stop this chain and he made that choice to stop it and he went into the church got on his knees and accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and his life changed because it was sincere in his heart and to this day I know he was involved in a church over here um, in Indian Hills but that's what the Lord wants be an example because people are watching you, especially your children. First Corinthians 11, once, one, Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now, he's not saying follow me. I know we're not to follow a man, but if you have a man or a woman following Christ, then follow them. Follow Christ with them. Seek after him also. If you have someone that's not and they're leading you away, that's time to say, okay, I'm not following so closely with that one because they're just leading me away astray in another direction peter said for this for to this you were called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps uh, obviously christ is the greatest example of all and he suffered for us so why can't we suffer for him uh, he is our example and we should follow in his footsteps every day who are you following Follow Jesus. Can't go wrong that way if you give your life to Jesus. The Bible's clear. Romans 3.23 for, for, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. This isn't a church that's telling people we don't sin. We're holy. No, we're not. We're pure. No, we're not. We are sinners. We fall short. It's very clear. Believe me. I have faults and I have sin in my life but I continue to sin less as the Lord is working in my life. So we're all sinners. And the Bible says in that next statement, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of that sin is death, but there's a gift. And that gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So we come to 6.23 of Romans, but the gift of God is is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even though we were sinners, Christ gave his life for us. He took our place on the cross so that we could have eternal life. And this is what Paul says. And it's very simple. It's so simple, it's almost insane to even believe. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's how simple it is. There's nothing you, you, you can do, nothing you have to do, but just believe that, hey, Jesus died on the cross in my place. And they buried him. And three days later, he resurrected. I believe that. Then you have eternal life. Romans 10, 13 says, says it again, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved.